right. Hello, hello, hello. Hey. Thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, this is Technical Hiccups, making the pipeline at Dillingu Studios by me, Cody Winchester. Uh, so the first thing we're going to go over is what is a pipeline? So for anyone who's new to 3D or has only ever heard the term pipeline, they might not know what it means. Basically, it's just a way you organize and structure your project and like the specific workflows and everything that you do in order to complete that project. And as a pipeline artist, your job is to make that as smooth as possible. So you're creating tools, coming up with new workflows so that your artist can work without any hindrance. And uh, every studio will have their own pipeline because they're gonna have their own wants and needs. And pipelines will change over time. So you have to be willing to adapt with them and go over hurdles you, you face and come up with better techniques. So a little bit about myself. I've been using Blender since uh, 2009. I'm a VFX artist. I do pretty much only anime style VFX. I'm also a developer. Do I have a couple add-ons like Abnormal, Lineworks, and MP the NPR Frame Rate Mixer. And uh, I've done some small contributions to Blender in the past. Uh, not so much recently, but uh, hopefully soon. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm also a uh, Pipeline Tools developer, which is the most important thing for this talk. I've been freelancing for a little over six years, and three of those with uh, Dillingu Studios. And for the past two years, a big part of my job has been developing our pipeline. So what is Dylan Goose Studios? Well, I'll let Dylan tell, tell you himself. <laughs> Hello, I am Dylan Goo. Uh, I'm the founder of Dylan Goo Studios. Um, I was very creative with the name, so <laughs> that helps a lot. Um, but yeah, so Dylan Goose Studios is a, a studio that has basically been founded on the idea of, you know, what if we created a fully independent remote studio that could make anything we wanted, right? We wanted to focus on anime style stuff. Um, we've been doing that for the past four years or so, um, and it's been amazing. We have a YouTube channel where we post all of our stuff, which is just youtube.com slash Dylan Goo, and uh, it's been an incredible ride. I think, you know, originally when I started my YouTube channel, it was just me. Um, and over the years, we grew to now a size of about 25 people, 25 to 30 people all around the world. And we'll talk about how we got a remote studio working in this talk. And I think it'd be really exciting for everybody because I've been very excited to work with everybody we've been, work we've been working with all around the world. My team's up here, by the way, if you guys say hi to them. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, a little bit about what we do. Take a look at this. This is the type of anime stuff that we've been doing for the past four years. Um, we've been doing all sorts of things, but the recent things have been mostly focused on, if you guys are familiar with like some of the gacha games that are popular today, so Genshin Impact, Ark Knights, Punishing Grey Raven. These are actually clients that have reached out to us to work on custom projects, custom cinematic trailers that we post on our YouTube channel. Um, and it's been an incredibly gratifying experience to you know, be able to work with clients, but also be able to have our own brand associated with it, where we have our own style of animation, our own style of you know, models and stuff like that. We make all these custom. There's, um, this is an Iron Mouse one. We did some with VTubers. Um, and we're really able to push, the, I think, the envelope of you know, what's possible in um, NPR as, as an industry, which we are very passionate about. And uh, we're hoping to help spread that with things like you know, Goo Engine, which is our custom engine that we're working on right now for NPR that we've been sharing with people. And um, hopefully in the future, uh, some stuff committed to, uh, to Blender itself, which would be really cool to help further NPR um, as a whole for everybody. So it's going to be exciting. We're very passionate about this, uh, and hopefully you guys will get a sneak peek on how that passion is manifested in our pipeline, uh, specifically. Um, yes, so yeah, very cool stuff. Shout out to the team. You guys are amazing. You can clap. It's fine. Yeah. 
So this is actually a really cool graph of how our pipeline has evolved over the past few years. You can see here, um, Cody made these amazing graphs to show our progress as a team, where we've actually went from you know only working on one big project at a time and crunching like crazy for it. You know, pipelines are made to exist to really streamline workflows for for artists and. We're very passionate about making sure we reduce crunch as much as possible. Every studio has it, it's not ideal. And you know that's something that we've been actively seeking to avoid with all of the innovations that we do in our pipeline. So what I'm really proud of is you can see as you go down this, this line, this timeline here, um, we've been actually doing more projects with less crunch over the past four years. Um, shout out to Cody for helping out with the pipeline stuff. Um, yeah, you know, you can clap again, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and not only have these projects been, you know, just as big as, you know, our original ones, we, we're doing more of them. We're doing several smaller projects at the same time as doing bigger projects. Our crunch time has gone down. You can see the crunch intensity there. Um, and uh, that's measured by basically how much sleep we get. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been incredible and uh, I, I couldn't be happier. And well, that's exactly why. Um, pipeline is an incredibly important process to avoid that exact problem of everybody brute forcing everything. Um, this is what I basically dealt with when I was working by myself, where I didn't have a pipeline. And when you're a one man army, that's possible. When you have a team, that's not possible. Uh, I brute forced everything when I was you know, a one man army and that was um, something I wasn't exactly proud of, but uh, something that we definitely desperately had to fix when we started growing. Um, so if you guys aren't familiar with what a pipeline is, which we talked about earlier, but like it's basically, making sure that everybody can sleep properly and pass files off to each other without worrying uh, that everything will break. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it off to Cody again to talk about the details, uh, which I think you guys will find very interesting. All right, so first, first we're going to go over uh, how our pipeline has changed in the last two years. Uh, we did a talk in the 2022 Blender Conference where we did a, a brief overview of our pipeline. So we're gonna look at that and see how it's different today. So back then we were using uh, Resilio Sync for our syncing software to get everyone uh, getting, all, have all the files in sync with each other. And today we've switched to Sync Thing. Sync Thing is very similar. It's also a peer-to-peer -peer file transfer software and, uh, but it's open source. So it also has a Python module, which allows us to integrate it with our tools, which we'll go over in a little, little bit. And then for our shot tracker, we, Becca in 2022, we were using Google Sheets, then we tried Notion for like a project or two, and then we switched to Coda. And today, we are still using Coda because it's pretty fantastic. Like, it keeps everything very organized and it's very flexible with the tools that you can add to it in Coda and it has a Python module so we can integrate it with our tools, which we have done extensively. And one of the really great features or tools that we've added with uh, Coda is we have these dashboards where you can see a filtered view of all the shots of a project for just you and it also can filter by what is actually available to work on. So here's my effects dashboard and it is filtering it to what is assigned to me and what is available based on the animation status. And also has tools on this dashboard to uh, submit, the, submit the shot for review so that Dylan will know to review it later. <clears throat> and our shot file structure was that we have all of our assets, they get linked into an anim file, they get linked in, the anim file gets linked into an FX file, and then the FX file gets linked into a final file. And then at the time we were doing library overrides of library overrides of library overrides. It was, <laughs> it was a lot of work, and it worked at the time for the project that we had done for this, but then the very next project, it didn't really work, and it, it lost a, a lot of sleep for us, so. We changed it to where it's just library overrides. No more nested library overrides. We completely removed them. We've also added a lighting file to our pipeline. Uh, because to, The big reason for that was the anim file had so much stuff in it and we needed to access it outside of the anim file so not everyone is just all working from one file. 
So we pushed lighting to a different file as well as various other workarounds to get as few people in the anim file as much as possible. And then our VSC project, uh, this is like, this is the actual edit of our project. So we have all of the shots laid out and you can see it like back then we had every shot laid out in sequential order and they were uh, stacked on top of each other. So you would have uh, anim, a layout in anim at the bottom and then it would go up to the final render up at top. And this, gave, this gives a very, uh, a good view of the whole project, and this uh, VSC gets linked into every other, uh, every shot file so that there's context for the project for the animators while they're working. And today, we are still using this because it's, it's just fantastic. <laughs> but now we are using Metastrips instead of stacking every single pipeline and just the main timeline. So what this allows is we can, like, we have the flexibility to adjust the edit. We can just drag around shots instead of everything being stacked and or laid out in sequential sequential order. And this uh, this is really good for like picture in picture shots where you have a character who's on a phone call and then you see a screen of the character in the same shot, so you can stack them on top of each other and there's it's not messing up the timing of the edit. <clears throat> And then we have our render management software, RenderCheck. Uh, this was what we were using back then, and we are still using it today because it is fantastic. And we've upgraded it. Uh, our other developer, late as usual, wrote a Rust module for us that solved like the biggest issue was that anytime a render would freeze, it just would never update, so we'd go to bed with 30 shots queued up to render, wake up and only two rendered and it froze on the third one. But now with the Rust module, it has a timeout check where it can check if it's been taken more than a certain threshold, like five minutes for a frame, it'll just kill that frame and then restart the renders and keep going. And we've integrated with Coda, so we have like statuses where it'll push statuses of the render to Coda and it'll read it. And it gives, uh, quick access to every file and every pipeline file. So it can be used kind of as a project manager, which is what I use it for a lot of the time. <clears throat> uh, it also has uh, support for multiple or selective uh, rendering of render passes. So we do a lot of uh, uh, separated rendering, like we'll render all the backgrounds at once because backgrounds are usually finished before character animation is. And then this gives us the option to just do selective rendering and not have to render everything all at once. And uh, one thing that uh, it's not done, it's like in progress, but we are making a worker version where people on our team can run a version that will scan for uh, render jobs and it'll render remotely on their machine and it'll sync it back to me so that I can compile everything and push it to uh, our actual final comp renders, or, which is uh, another thing that it does. <clears throat> so then let's go over the new tools and workflows. So our tools have all been made what I would refer to as context aware. So we have this, uh, this visual of what our our uh, folder structure is like, we have the user folders where people, our users will pull shots into it from the pipeline so they can work on it uh, without uh, messing with the actual pipeline and then they can later push to the pipeline. And then we have uh, an assets folder to the side of it. <clears throat> and we have these three static folders for every project where you have a category, a subcategory, and a project, the project name. And what this does is it allows the user folder to be completely independent of like the actual structure of the project. Like they can customize their folder structure as they want. But with those top three static folders, it can always uh, figure out what project it's a part of and we can just work on as many projects simultaneous, simultaneously as we want. And then we have our push pull operators. These are, they sound simple because all they do really is they open a blend file and then save it into a different folder. 
but it's become hugely important to our pipeline because it, it gives us an opportunity to automate a lot of stuff and, uh, and it just fixes any issues of uncertainty of like how, what, what file to pull or where to put or what to name it. It just automates everything for the users. <clears throat> and uh, it has uh, filters, so we, we can filter it by uh, coda shot assignment. So you have, like here you have this big list of, uh, of shots and with the only assigned shots, you can filter it down just to the shots that you have. So you don't have to figure out what you can work on, it'll just show you. So here is an example of what a start of a project might look like. This is in a uh, users folder. They run this operator to create those top three static folders for the project. And then they have a pull file where they can open that and they can pull from and they can get their shots without really having to think about anything. So here you have the, uh, the full unfiltered list of the shots. This is like a 250 shot project and then we set it to assigned and now we have just what you need. And then when you run it, it'll start filling your uh, user folder with the shot files. Just like that. And then after you've pulled them, if you run it again, we have this option to limit the filtering to only shots that you have not already pulled. So then it makes just things much simpler. All right, then we have our pushing operators. They're very simple. They just push it in back into the pipeline. So once you've made your changes, it goes back into the pipeline and you have an option to fill out a publish log. And here, uh, this video is demonstrating a uh, new feature, or relatively new feature we have where if you submit a character file to the pipeline, you can open a test file, <clears throat> which will open a new Blender file. It'll link in the character, override it, and then put a range of motion action onto the character so you can see the weighting in real time. And it will point out pretty much any sort of uh, weighting errors before the actual uh, animators get their hands on and then <laughs> have to tell you to fix the weights. And uh, the last thing it does is uh, these pushing operators are, we use them as a chance to basically clean up every single file. So we have a rather long list <laughs> of operations that are uh, cleanup operations that we run on both assets and shots. You don't have to read all this. This is just to show you that it does a lot of stuff every single time a user pushes a file. And that, that alone has saved a lot of headache because it just keeps everything working properly. And we're always adding to this. So like I filled this out a couple weeks ago. It's already out of date. We've added many things to it. <laughs> So then uh, pipeline messages, um, when, uh, when a uh, user pushes, that push and uh, both push and pull is uh, saved to a log file, a, a JSON file. And we use that with these pipeline messages in order to communicate to the users any information that is necessary. So we do this with, instead of, uh, or we do this with custom draw handlers instead of using a just normal Python alert because as, as far as I have found, the Python alerts are just very easy to ignore. They just like pop up on the screen and then if you move your mouse, they're gone. You And then a user won't really know to go looking for what the error was. So this puts a custom draw handler in 3D view. You can't ignore it. It's very big, it's very flashy. <laughs> It's, it is meant to be intrusive and annoying so that you will follow what it says. <laughs> so these are uh, some of the examples of our, our pipeline messages. The top one is just a, uh, a confirmation that you have successfully pushed your file to the pipeline. And the bottom one is saying that you are good to work in this file, but you need to pull it so that everyone else will know that you are working on it.
And then we have, <laughs> we have the red operators, which are bad, obviously. Uh, the top one informs you that your file is a part of the pipeline log, but you are a certain amount of pushes behind. And the middle one will tell you that you, um, your file is not in the log, so it's possible that some work was lost along the way and you need to figure it out. And then the bottom one just tells you if you're, in the, if you're actually in the pipeline file that there's a possibility that it's just still syncing. Like you, there's a desync between the pipeline uh, log and the file, so it might still be syncing uh, <clears throat> someone's changes. Then we got this yellow warning, which <laughs> is just letting you know that someone else has pulled the file that you're opening. So you have to consult with them to figure out uh, if you're good to work on it or if they need to push changes or just, it, it opens up uh, communication between the artists. And then we got the blue one, which is just, it, it can't detect that sync thing is on. So you need to be wary of that so that you're, you're up to date with everything. And we got the purple operators. These are our uh, purple messages. These are new. Uh, we've inter we've uh, put in a system for character reviews. So a rigging artist will submit their character for a review that a rigging supervisor can then review and then decide whether or not it's good enough to uh, be pushed into the pipeline. So these just tell you like that it's being reviewed and like various uh, iterations on that it's we're still testing this one so it's probably going to change then we have a couple of play blast operators so the first one is publish play blast and this is very i mean this does exactly what pushing a shot does but with the addition of play blasting your shot at the end and it it'll play blast into a local folder and after that's done, it'll copy the MP4 from your local folder into the pipeline folder so that it gets updated into the VSC timeline and everyone is kept up to date with your, with your changes. And then we have a context play blast operator, which is what this video is showing, where it just does a normal play blast and it, it finds the MP4s from the pipeline of the previous and the next shots, and you can set how many shots and it uses uh, FFmpeg to just combine them into one MP4. And it's, it's very handy for just, uh, for when you have a shot that needs context of, to get feedback. And another thing we've done, which is huge because it, it saves me a lot of time, is we fully automated our render setup and our finaling. So our final files, they contain all the render layers and all the render passes for a shot and they, it separates the characters' backgrounds into different scenes so that they can have different render settings. And so this, yeah, this used to be done manually, but it was, <laughs> it was a lot of work. It's why we crunched a lot in the beginning and why we are not crunching as much now because this is what it does. That, I don't want to set that up for one shot. <laughs> Now I don't want to do it for 250 shots. If, if I was still, I'd still be working on this project if that was the case. <laughs> so this, this works mainly by having uh, standardized work, workflows and standardized um, collection naming. And like we use uh, like specific naming tags for every asset so that they the um, the the script can find it and filter every render layer based on those naming conventions and this is uh just some advice if you're if you haven't started using geonodes you should i mean it's not just great for like effects and stuff it's also really great for creating pipeline tools so here at the top left, we have this drop shadow uh, solution for a character. We found that the shadows from Eevee are not great at emulating the like uh, simplified animation, like drop shadow that you see. So I created this uh, solution where it, it calculates the character and figures out just like the general shape of it and simplifies it down to create this 
stylized drop shadow, which ever since we implemented, we, I don't think we've used any actual like shadow caster solutions. We just use this because it, it works really well. And then we have uh, some other solutions or uh, other tools here that allow for like adaptive subdivision based on camera screen space size. So we can add resolution as we get closer and closer to a character. And of course we wanna add, add limits to that so we're not doing you know 10 subdivisions on a character. And at the bottom we have uh, a tool called, uh, that we've shown in the past, I believe, called Camera Keys. Uh, it deforms the character based on the angle of the camera to the character. And uh, it's, uh, so it, it, the original version used uh, drivers and uh, Python functions in those drivers and it, it worked, but it was slow and it was causing a lot of crashes for us. So then we switched the back end of it to just use geometry nodes. And now it's very fast. People can, our uh, artists can use it in real time if they choose. And uh, I don't think it's caused a single crash since because it's just, it's just Blender working with geometry nodes. It's not doing anything fancy. So it's much more stable. Then we have uh, tools for performance. So all of our characters are set up with um, with these like proxy objects to uh, for performance for the animators. And we have three buttons for choosing which uh, version of the character you want. So we have, here's the proxy character. Then we have this hybrid character where just the head is the full resolution. And this is mainly useful for like lip sync passes because you, know, you don't want all that geometry of the body slowing down your viewport and, and you could just focus on the full resolution lip sync. And then we have obviously the full resolution character for like clipping passes and the final passes. Right. And uh, yeah, our, our, uh, our studio is fully on Discord. So we've started to use webhooks to integrate uh, our tools with Discord. So whenever a user pushes or pulls, it is, uh, it is logged in a Discord channel where we, uh, we have the, the file name, who pushed it, the pipeline, the log of their, their push, and it also takes a viewport render and posts it with it so that we, we have a, another log and it keeps whoever, whoever cares to uh, follow it, they can be in the know and know who is working on what. And then one thing that I really like about Discord is we have these uh, feedback threads where every person can make their own thread. So instead of like five people all getting feedback in one channel and like it's very easy for stuff to get lost when everyone's posting stuff for feedback everyone has their own isolated feedback thread and it keeps everything uh nice and clean then we have a, a series of uh bulk operators these uh are for just doing a lot of uh, doing operations on basically every single file of our pipeline and you can you we have filters for you can filter by user you can filter by the asset and you can choose which of the shots you uh wanted to run on uh one of the our main one is the bulk play blast operator so you can change you can do a play blast of the entire project in a set pipeline you can change uh or set what uh, render view you want it, whether a solid view or rendered view, uh, view or uh, uh, material preview. And this, uh, this is very handy towards the end of the project when we need to view the project as a whole, or especially for like specific pipelines, and we don't have time to do, wait for all the renders. We just want to get this out so we can have multiple people running this, and it's all pushing to uh, the VSC, and then we have that updated view of our project. And then we have a, a bulk resync uh, operator. This basically just opens every file that, that you tell to with uh, auto resync on. So it fixes all the links and then it'll, it'll uh, push your shot into the file. So then it also does the 
cleanup operations that you want to do. Then we have a, uh, a bulk cleanup operator, which is uh, all, our, uh, our layout files, when they're done, they're done in uh, like big chunks. So you can have a shot where it's just a single character, but the layout file had nine characters in it. So then that file with that's only one character that you want to render has eight other characters in there clogging it up. So we can use uh, asset tagging from Coda to go through and filter out and remove those extra assets from the files. And it just makes everything cleaner and faster for rendering. And our last one is we have a, uh, we have an output line art uh, bulk operator. This is because we use uh, PSOF for our, our line art and it is, it requires a license and we don't have many licenses because it's expensive. So <laughs> we, we limit it, we have basically two computers. I have one and Dylan has one. Uh, and so we'll do all the line art from the, those computers. And what it'll do is, <laughs> it's quite hacky, but it, uh, for, for PSoft, you have to render the image in order for it to generate the line art. And what we will do is we will set the, the scene to 1% resolution and we'll set every single material to not use nodes so we don't have to compile a ton of materials and it'll render that. And then we hard coded PSOFT's add-on to always do full resolution. So we're just, <laughs> we're hacking our way through this really annoying process to make it faster, but it works. <laughs> And we've started to use After Effects for our compositing. Uh, before this, After Effects was more of an optional thing. Is it was like if we had time, we would use it. The I think Dylan said that the biggest issue with using After Effects was that the the setup time for getting everything imported, getting it all layered correctly, and then you don't have much time to actually work on it when you're on a tight deadline. So we've, uh, I, I made this script that will automatically import every shot for a sequence or now we're using uh, look IDs so that it'll import every shot of a look ID and put it all in order and then you can do the compositing on all these shots at the same time instead of doing one shot per file it'll group them all together because they're all similar looks. They're going to have very similar like color grading and effects are going to get very similar uh, effects put on top of them. And it, it, it basically turns it from having to do uh, comp on 200 shots to doing comp on like 10. And for our compositing passes, we are... Uh, we are outputting background effects and characters separately. Uh, and we have started to output our characters uh, without uh, holdout applied. So every character is rendered in isolation from each other. And uh, here you can see the passes. We have this, uh, this ID map pass, which is helpful in comp for selectively changing parts of the character. And we have the, we output the shading of the character in a black and white mask so that we can then alter the shading if we need to. And we have the, the light and shadow colors separate. And you can see that in the, in the shading mask, it is not uh, like conform, it's not conformed to the, the alpha of the character. It is, we use the end paint node to expand the shading of the character. Cause if we were to like, say we we're to try to blur the shading at the edges of the character, if it goes from white to black, you would get this weird like halo effect where the shading is not correct. <clears throat> and uh, so since we don't do holdout in uh, Blender, we do it in After Effects now. So very similar to the shading mask, what we do is we have each character exports a depth pass and it also exports an, uh, an expanded depth pass. So it takes, the <clears throat> it takes the depth of the character, removes any, uh, any pixels with alpha less than one. 
uh, so that you don't get the, the feathering of the depth from the actual character's depth to the like infinity depth that or the maximum clipping depth. And uh, you use the inpaint node to expand their depth so that when we create the holdout mask, you can have characters that have like displacement or distortion on them and it is not affecting the holdout mask. And then for our effects passes, we use a, a naming convention of uh, GU, BU, NU, GO, BO, NO. This basically means glow under or glow over, blur under, or blur over, or nothing over, or nothing under, nothing over. So this, uh, we, the script uses this to know whether or not this effects pass goes above the characters or below them. And then it can give an indication to the compositing artist whether they're going to blur it or they're going to glow it, and uh, or they're just it's, nothing's going to get put on, and they have to figure it out themselves. <laughs> All right. All right. And I'm uh, going to do real quick, just like what I would say are good practices for having a good pipeline. Uh, these are things that I found to be very helpful. So number one, automate, automate, automate. This is huge. <laughs> automate as much as you possibly can. It makes everything so much simpler. This is how we are able to complete uh, like a 12 minute animation with 250 shots in six weeks. Like it's so much of it is streamlined that we don't have to deal with the very annoying issues that made us lose sleep when we first started. And the way that automation works is using standardized naming conventions and workflows. Uh, this is, I mean, it's essential, like, you can't, if you have everything named differently, you can't really automate it because you can't predict anything. And we have, uh, so uh, statically name your main files. So if you have an asset file that is being linked into shots, do not have multiple versions. So don't have a V2, V3, V4. Have one file that you are linking in. If you are going to have a separate version that gets linked in and it's different enough, make a new asset. Don't don't be clogging it with different versions and you're having to fix broken links because the naming changed. <clears throat> then we have uh, create buttons, uh, create buttons for simple tasks. So this is like uh, this is our pushing operator. Very simple task, but we use that as a chance to make everything work like we we that's where you can inject whatever you want you can control everything in those buttons and then we uh store information in your json files uh we at, at the beginning render tech like our render tech uh software only it, it didn't have any access to any information from the rendering files it can only scan the blend files themselves so now that we have all the information stored in the JSON file, we can pretty much do whatever we want. Like we can have any information and it just really expands the opportunities of what your tools can do. And then uh, limit the use of add-ons that dynamically alter data. Uh, I'm not gonna name them, but there are quite a few add-ons that we've banned from our studio. <laughs> Lots of render errors that I do not like. <laughs> I think some of the developers are here, so I will not name them. Uh, and uh, one example of this is camera keys. We, it, at the time, it was causing lots of issues with crashing and freezing, and when, uh, when it would crash and then the render would restart, what would happen is that first frame of the restart, the camera keys would be off, and then we'd get these flickers where the character's hair would just pop, just single pops all over the place, very hard to find. We have 12,000 frames, we're not going to find the 20 pops in it. It's just too much. So then uh, draw, out, uh, draw out your ideas before you start to code them. Uh, this is what I, I do this all the time. I like to create uh, flow charts and just graphs of what, uh, what systems we're making because this gives you an opportunity to basically develop the, uh, the tool before you ever actually start developing it because you're by drawing it out you're gonna be thinking about all the issues that it's gonna face and you're gonna, you're basically doing a pre-pass on your coding. And uh, this one's not gonna to apply to everyone, but if it's possible, work within the pipeline yourself. So since I'm uh, also a VFX artist and I work as a VFX artist for Dylan, 
uh, that gives me a chance to experience the pipeline tools before uh, anyone else does, because like when I put a new pipeline tool in, I'll probably be testing it and using it myself. This gives me, uh, this lets me know of like anything that's going to go wrong with it and like annoyances, ways we can improve it. And I can sometimes fix bugs before anyone, anyone has to, uh, to report them to me, which I really enjoy. <laughs> then, uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, take notes of issues during production. Uh, it is very easy to forget things, like even, no matter how annoying an issue is, you think you're gonna remember it, it good chance you won't. So mark, like write down your, your issues, and also uh, at the end of a production, try to uh, just like do a postmortem. At Dylan, at Dylan Goose Studios, we do postmortems for every single project where everyone answers questions about what went good, what went bad, and then we can, with that information, we can pinpoint the biggest issues and stuff we need to change before the next project. And then uh, Play Blast with metadata burned in. So there is an option with the Play Blast so you can do metadata and gets, it gets uh, written onto the frames of the MP4. This is extremely helpful for feedback and just keeping everything clear because if you get a if you get an MP4 and to review and there's no name on it, no frame count, nothing, you're it's just going to be constant questions of what shot is this, what what uh, what frame is this? Like if you're giving feedback, oh there we go. <laughs> if you're giving feedback, you you want to know frames so you can tell, so the, so you can tell someone oh on frame 1045 this happens. Uh, you might want to delay it to. 1055. It, it makes things much clearer and easier for, for feedback. And then uh, start all files from a set frame. Uh, it's good to go with like a high frame so you have plenty of um, time before that for simulation caches or just pretty much anything. It gives you room, breathing room at the beginning of a shot and it keeps things consistent. We used to do uh, sequential frame shots and it made it very hard to add new shots because then everything got offset and we would have to go back through every file and like fix up the frame ranges. And then uh, don't be afraid to create hacky operators. This kind of conflicts with limit use of uh, add-ons that dynamically alter data, but if you write it yourself, you can be confident it's gonna work. So you don't have to worry about the hackiness if you are the one writing it, because then you can also be the one that fixes it when it goes wrong. And then uh, have a default solution for anything that is manual. So uh, an example of this is um, we uh, are lighting for our characters. We were doing lighting uh, fully manual when we first introduced the uh, lighting file. And when you get down to a crunch, if you don't have a default solution, if there's something, if something that requires manual work, that's just a ton of time that is being added on to an already stressful situation. So if you have a default lighting setup for our case, it lets you get renders out with that so you can test everything and know that it's gonna be good. And then if you have time later, you can go back and fix up and do the manual work, but you have that uh, automatic solution to fall back on. And thank you for listening. That is the talk. All right. So that's uh, that's my contact info if you want to get in touch, and also the studio's email if you want to get in touch with the studio. All right. I think we have about five, six minutes uh, if there's any questions. Hi. So when it comes to drawing out your ideas uh, before you design them, like how does that look like to you? Like, do you just draw out the actual UI of the tool or is it more like here's how the data is going to flow through uh, this pipeline? Yeah. Let me show you. I was going to include a visual of it, Ooh. but then I didn't. <laughs> uh, 
I did not prepare this question. <laughs> uh, um, okay. Uh, so I'll just answer while I'm finding it. Uh, I, I'll use stuff like Miro.com, uh, which just gives you basically just boxes with lines between them. And then I will, uh, <clears throat> I will like write out in detail the information that I, I need to convey. So it's a simplified view of it, but then there's detailed information where I, I talk about the, uh, the idea of what it is that, it, that I'm doing. Yeah, real quick. Oh, here we go. So something like this, where I lay out the uh, the structure, and then I have off to the side. Uh, can't really read it, but <laughs> it's too low resolution. But it'll say what that file like is supposed to do, what uh, what it shouldn't do, and all those details. And then it's just various graphs like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, with your uh, your list of like uh, important points, I agree with every single one except for the one about statically named main files. I've just had a big debate about that in oh, yeah. recent pipeline about the pros and cons of either either side. I'm wondering how you deal with the pitfalls of that, i.e., if you have to update a rig that's already in production. Because in a lot of the places I've worked, the way they do that is you will have, mm -hmm. much like you do with software, you'll have the stable version, then you'll have yeah, the testing yeah. version, and then the next stable version. And then the yeah. shots that are already being done, you can always re-render them because you can go, it's got a record of that version mm -hmm. that it used, rather than just having the single main file. And the other, yeah. the other pitfall is if, you, if the rigger releases something and oops, there's a problem with it, it's broken every single shot that has that. Mm. But how do you get around that? That's what I mean. uh, well, the big thing is that our productions have been uh, pretty short, so they're like max four months. Most are like two to three months, so we don't really run into the issue of like uh, such a drastic change that it breaks anything. Uh, but I, yeah, I do see how that could be an issue. Like uh, we do save backups of like various things. Like if we're going to make a drastic alteration, we would save a backup for it and like we could switch it out if needed and then just replace that, that yeah. main one. I, I can answer that in more detail too because yeah. recently we talked about it a little bit with the purple little icons too. We have a new review file that we're doing specifically for that so when the riggers push something there's a sort of uh, in, in limbo file that has the most up-to-date thing. That's the more recent one and the, the statically named one is the stable one that you mentioned. And we don't update the stable one until we're sure that it's working. So that's one of the things we're doing to mitigate those pitfalls specifically, because we have run into those, especially when like something's been pushed that does break some things. We're, we're working on, on that particular solution. But we still think that having statically named files is easier for the pipeline to adapt for the most part. So we're just trying to mitigate those pitfalls. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anybody else? Hey, yeah. Uh, how do you review in your shots, like um, <clears throat> with automation? Uh, it's basically doing, you basically doing it in Discord or uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll automate some stuff to yeah. make sure that everything online. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, every, all of our communication is through Discord. Uh, we do it through uh, the feedback threads. Uh, Dylan is usually the one uh, reviewing, but we also have uh, our lead animators that will do reviews uh, but it's it's mainly through that and then uh, the director dashboard I would also have tools for keeping track of what needs to be reviewed any other questions oh, there we go. hello hey. um, 
You have a lot of integration with Coda, um, mm -hmm. yes. and it is somewhat terrifying for me because I create very hacky add-ons. Um, how do you manage your library and your functions so that um, everything is updating properly to Coda and that you are dealing with the slight amount of time lag uh, for pushing information and pulling information? Yes, the time lag. Uh, at first, it was we just dealt with it by waiting. Uh, now we store a local version of the Coda dictionary, so we we create a dictionary from it and we save that to a JSON file. So then we can uh, we can update the JSON file and send to Coda at the same time. But we also have a operator to refresh that local Coda data, and it'll just grab everything from it and then save it and then. So with that local one, we just we get speed ups for uh, the tools that don't need to necessarily necessarily ping Coda itself. We we choose when to actually get it from Coda itself because it can be slow. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, do you have an automatic? Um, quality check after the animation before lighting or so? And if yes, how it happens? Uh, no, not really. I mean, it's just the feedback. Like, uh, it, it has to go through a final, it has to go through final say by Dylan or the leads to say that it's good enough to then go on further in the pipeline. But uh, yeah, the, the lighting and effects files don't always wait for the animation to be done. It, it can, like some effects, like if you have like uh, a character's skin, like something is changing with that, then you'll need uh, the final animation. But if you're just adding an explosion, you can just add that to the effects and it's gonna, uh, you don't need to wait for it. So the, the animation files are very often getting CBBs or could be betters until the very end of the project. And because everything is linked, it, it just updates and it's fine. And like we might have to go back in and fix up lighting, but it's it's pretty rare for that to happen. Is it just it, it, we just can update it as long, as late as we want, like sometimes very last minute. So basically, what you are telling uh, is that if there are geometry crashes or floating, uh, you can see it only like on the lighting stage, and then go back to animation mm. again. Is it a problem of the production? Uh, I mean, the, the, like, we have clipping passes, so like uh, toward the end, once the assets are starting to get finalized, we will go back through and do separate passes of fixing the crashing or clipping. And we just, since we off put that towards the end, it, it hasn't been too much of an issue. Yeah, to answer that a little bit more, one thing that we didn't stress enough is the reason why we have so many different files like anim effects, lighting, is so that we can work on them at different times and they still update each other. They don't depend on each other super like statically. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, like when we do effects or we do lighting, like we'll parent things to the animation files. Like uh, for example, you, you've, Cody, I know you've done like empties parented to the rig and yep. then had the effects parented to that empty so that no matter what happens to the animation, the effects will still follow that stuff. So that happens with lighting and things like that. And for like quality checks, that's mostly like, we'll do constant play blasts of each pipeline file when it gets pushed. And so because we have that synchronized timeline that we showed, every time we look at that timeline, we can see if there's any big errors as we go along. Yeah, so we kind of have like the most up-to-date mm -hmm. version of the file in the timeline at all times. Yeah. And, uh uh, a big reason why the lighting doesn't need to be fixed up if there's animation changes, we have the, the like the lighting of the, the for the hair and the face is parented to the head. So if they adjust the head, it's going to follow and it's going to be still pretty good. Like it, it might need adjustment, but it's not totally necessary. And yeah, uh, a workaround for the not using library or overrides in the effects is we use, I'll add an empty that copy transforms onto the bone of a linked animation file and it'll with that copy transform it'll always update as if I was using, using a library override but I don't have to so it's much nicer yeah. yeah I think we have time for one more question if anybody has any any more oh back there there <laughs> Hello. 
Um, so I'm looking at the all the optimizations basically you made for the pipeline, and I was wondering, since I'm working you know by myself, mm -hmm. which ones, in your opinion, would be the most useful ones for like a one-man team to apply to their own workflow to make just better? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, maybe the top three or whatever you think. Um, well, with a one-man person, like having separate files would still be good so you have everything isolated uh you're not going to get the benefit of like simultaneously working on it because you're one person you can't work on <laughs> multiple things at the same time uh yeah I, I would say maybe like the push logs just so that you have a record of what you did and so if you ever need like oh you need to remember what you did you you have that log there to go back through and remember and like hopefully debug whatever it is went wrong yeah i can answer that question too yeah. um as i've worked alone on projects before and the biggest thing that i think is library overrides if you're not using them you should i know a lot of people uh, append files and like rigs and stuff when they're working alone which i used to do don't ever do that <laughs> um it is a nightmare uh there's benefits yeah. to it but of course i think it the the pros of linking files outweighs you know local files um, so I definitely recommend that. And then I think if you can, um, using sync thing for backups is good. You don't have to share the files with anybody, but if you use sync thing to create a backup of, of your pipeline, uh, on a different computer, maybe for rendering, for example, for like a render farm, those are really useful for a one man team too. Like that's fine. And you'll never lose files because you'll have it on another computer. Sync thing also creates backups automatically. Um, you know, up to five versions or something like that. Like you can set it up where it creates backups for you. And that's also going to be a huge lifesaver if you're working alone. So there you go. Yep. All right. Cool. Well, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.